Shonen villains are remembered for the incredible battles that they partake in. Within Bleach, there are several antagonists who have taken part in multiple battles, but there are some fights that you just remember more than others, like Aizen's iconic battle with Ichigo or Yuhobak's incredible fight against Ichibei. Now, when it comes to the Bleach light novels, the author Ryogo Narita had the help of Tait Kubo in order to write an all new story which takes place a few months after the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Narita had introduced us to the antagonist Tokinada Suniyashiro, and he had established him as the embodiment of chaotic evil within Bleach. And while on paper he is an incredible villain, it was a different challenge for Narita to craft a memorable fight that was worthy of the villain that Tokinada was. During Can't Fear Unworld, Tokinada fights against the might of the Gote 13. During this fight, there's a lot of opportunity for several characters to shine, and it also allows Tokinada to have his own moment in the spotlight, which sets him apart from the other villains within Bleach. And while not a lot of you will know about Tokinada's fight against the Gote 13, in my opinion, it's already one of Bleach's most iconic and classic fights. This fight sheds light on multiple mysteries within the lore of Bleach, as well as reintroducing certain abilities from the Bleach manga that we thought that we were already familiar with, but we are left awestruck because new context is added for how some of these abilities function. I'm really looking forward to breaking down Tokinada versus the Gote 13 because it's full of a lot of strategy and wit. Be sure to stick around until the very end of this video because I believe that one of the greatest things about this fight is its aftermath. Because thanks to this fight, we understand the position that the Soul Society is in during the events of the one-shot chapter No Breeds From Hell. So if you want to know about the state of the Soul Society during the Hell arc, then you're definitely going to want to watch this video. Without further delay, here is my breakdown and analysis of Tokinada versus the Gote 13. Discover the Undead Collection and be amongst the very first to join us on our journey over at Getsuga.com. There are several characters who have justified reasons to want to defeat Tokinada. Firstly, you have Shunsui for the way that Tokinada had framed Ukitake as the villain in the eyes of Ginjo and Ichigo. Then you have Ginjo who was wronged by Tokinada when he had killed his friends when Tokinada was hunting for Soul King fragments in order to create the hybrid being Hikone. Hisagi was also wronged indirectly by Tokinada because it was thanks to Tokinada that Hisagi's former captain Tozen had fallen into darkness. Later, Hisagi would go on to have hatred for Tokinada for how he had transformed Hikone into a monster. The forbringer Ora Michibane is another candidate who wants to kill Tokinada because she greatly cared for Hikone and had wanted to save them from Tokinada. Yoriichi even nominates that Byakuya is worthy to kill Tokinada due to how much he had insulted Hisana to his face. As with a lot of antagonists, Tokinada has angered several individuals who have every right to go after his head. With so many individuals wanting to kill Tokinada, I believe that the writer of Can't Fear Your Own World, Narita, had done a fantastic job by having multiple characters fighting against Tokinada at the same time. After Tokinada escapes from Yoriichi and Siphon, he retreats to the Valley of Screams. Now, he had used this pocket dimension as his base of operations as he leaves in order to prepare for the final battle against the Shinigami. Shunsui and the other captains make it there, and they are accompanied by the surviving Sparta trio, the Fullbringers, as well as all of the surviving Sternritter. It made sense that everyone was gathered here because these different factions shared a mutual interest of not wanting their home worlds destroyed by Tokinada's evil plans. Now, this wasn't the first time that all of these factions had joined together because we did see them team up during the Thousand Year Blood War arc during the final battle against Yuhobak. Tokinada wastes very little time as he goes to greet them, which leads to him then just mocking and deriding all of the characters who were present, and considering the fact that he shares a lot of history with some of these individuals, it takes him very little time to find material to use to mock them. This then leads to him divulging all of his motives about how he wants to overturn the present order of the world. Deciding that he has had enough of this yapathon, Shunsui decides to shut Tokinada up with a surprise attack. This is similar to the backstab that he had used against Aizen, as Shunsui uses Kageoni in order to travel behind Tokinada 
Hitler in an attempt to cut him down right from the get-go. The surprise attack was unsuccessful because Tokinada was in some way expecting it, as he skillfully blocks the attack and prepares to engage everybody in battle. Now there was no way that Tokinada was planning to fight all of these captains, Fullbringers, Sternritters and Aranka by himself. Tokinada is nowhere near a powerhouse like Aizen or Yuhabak. So for this reason, Tokinada had a trump card which he was preparing for this scenario, as he then goes on to summon Hikone. Now faster than anybody could perceive, Hikone instantly appears at the request of Tokinada. Everybody present could sense the monstrous spiritual pressure which had just suddenly appeared above them. The light novels describe Hikone's spiritual pressure as being a ominous presence that seemed to warp their perception of time. The spiritual pressure was so dense that all of the individuals present felt like they had been exposed to Hikone's Reatsu for several hours despite it having only been a few seconds. Tokinada orders the child to kill everybody present, to which Hikone happily agrees to. So the tide of the battle turns as the Quincy and the Aranka switch their attention to Hikone, who at the moment is definitely the most threatening opponent on the battlefield. Hikone immediately releases the Zanpakuto Iko Mikidomoe as the Hollow manifests in a relatively small version of its gigantic self, which Hikone gets on top of and begins riding it. The two then begin to attack the Aranka and the Quincy present, as the Aranka trio, Haribel, Grimjow and Nell waste very little time as they activate their resurrection. It was thanks to their ability Peskisa which had allowed them to understand how dangerous Hikone and Ikomikidomoe were. Now it's at this point in the fight that Kimpachi had stopped trying to attack Tokinada as he was weighing out his options on who was the more stronger opponent to fight. He had eventually concluded on fighting Hikone but I delve into detail about this battle against Hikone in a separate video which I've got on my channel as this battle results in Hisagi battling against Hikone as we understand the incredible dynamic between these two characters. So I highly recommend that you check that video out after this one. Both Shunsui and Tokinada watch Hikone and their Zanpakuto devastate the area with their immense power. Shunsui detects that Hikone possesses hollow powers which are very similar to Ichigo's. Tokinada explains to him the details of Hikone while they clash their Zanpakuto, as they both try their hardest in order to kill each other. During their clashes, Tokinada continues to do what he does best as he tries to get into Shunsui's head. But Shunsui takes advantage of the situation as he counters with his pinky promise ability. Now this technique allows him to punish Tokinada or himself if either of them lie, thus forcing Tokinada into a position where he is forced to speak the truth. This leads to Shunsui asking if he had truly nothing to do with the Central 46 judgement against Nanao's mother. Tokinada denies being involved in this. He states that while he wasn't involved with the judgement, he was the one who has suggested that Nanao's mother should be tortured so that she could reveal whether if her daughter had the Issei clan sacred sword or not. This angers Shunsui but Tokinada clarifies that the head of the Kuchiki clan Ginrei Kuchiki at the time had squashed this proposal so it wasn't successful. As they continue to clash swords, Shunsui steps back and asks Tokinada what the name of his Zanpakuto is. Shunsui already knew the name that Tokinada was using but he had suspected that Kyuten Kyokoku wasn't the correct name of Tokinada's Zanpakuto. Shunsui had come to this conclusion after carefully considering all of the abilities that were displayed by Tokinada and they just did not match up with what he had expected of a Zanpakuto which was being protected by the Sunayashiro family. We learned that Tokinada had intentionally been referring to a Zanpakuto with a false name in order to weaken its abilities. This is a callback to the fake Karakura Town arc where we learned that Yumichika was also referring to a Zanpakuto with an incorrect name. Now due to Tokinada and Shunsui still being under the effects of Shunsui's ability, so Tokinada is compelled to speak the truth, as he reveals that Kyuten Kyokoku is a false name. He had come up with this name in order to spite Shunsui because it sounds similar to his Zanpakuto's name Katen Kyokotsu. Tokinada had purposefully weakened his Zanpakuto so that he could later see the despair on the faces of everyone when they realize that they are utterly outclassed by him when he awakens his true Zanpakuto. Tokinada wastes no more time as he unleashes his true power by activating his Zanpakuto Enra Kyoten. Shunsui takes the opportunity to attempt to kill Tokinada before he can finish releasing his Zanpakuto. But strangely, Tokinada decides to walk into Shunsui's attack instead of retreating. He ends up getting impaled on Shunsui's blade and this is before Shunsui could direct his stab towards Tokinada's vitals. Insanely, he allowed himself to be cut non-fatally just so that he could finish saying the release command of his Zanpakuto. 
Enra Kyoten then begins to glow very brightly as a distraction Sui long enough for Tokinada to knock him away with a kick. After the bright light emanating from Enra Kyoten subsides, Tokinada is revealed to be completely unharmed, despite being run through by Shunsui Zanpakuto. The hole that was made in Tokinada's clothing was still visible, but the wound was gone. Another very surprising thing is that the Zanpakuto blade of Enra Kyoten has disappeared, leaving just a hilt in Tokinada's hand. Shunsui and Nanao were struggling to pinpoint what the true ability of Enra Kyoten could be. They wondered whether if the Zanpakuto had the ability to manipulate light, but this wouldn't explain how Tokinada's wounds had magically disappeared. There were a lot of odd variables about this Zanpakuto, and the one that was standing out the most is the disappearance of Enra Kyoten's blade. Tokinada reassures everybody that they are going to find out the true power of his Zanpakuto eventually. As Shunsui and Tokinada begin to talk once again, Yoriichi uses uses the opportunity to sneak behind Tokinada and send him flying with a kick. Now right in the line of Tokinada's trajectory was another Shinigami who was waiting to land an attack of his own. Kensei activates his Bankai and lands a devastating punch on Tokinada's body, which leads to his body suffering from multiple internal explosions as it once again sends him flying. Now this should have been more than enough to cause Tokinada fatal damage, but once again Tokinada emerges from the dust with only damage to his clothing but no wounds on his body. Now Yoriichi notes that while she was kicking Tokinada, he had reflexively tried to stab her foot with his blade. She also notices that the foot that Tokinada had tried to stab appears to have gotten heavier afterwards. Now this was the first instance of Enra Kyoten using its true power, which is to mimic another Zanpakuto. Here it was obviously mimicking the ability of Kira's Zanpakuto Wabisuke. Tokinada then begins to attack once again, but this time he releases a Reiatsu that is so sinister and ominous that even the Quincy and Aranka, who are quite a distance away, could feel the evil spiritual pressure emanating from Tokinada. Shunsui is quick to react as he grabs Nanao and moves her away to safety, because as they were moving, a strange creature had sped through the space that Nanao was standing in. Now this creature is described as a round ball with a mouth and sharp teeth. Oddly enough, Shunsui had recognized what it was, because it was none other than Gakaku Kairo. This was the Shikai ability of the late Kimpachi Kuriyashiki. Tokinada sends a bunch more of these creatures towards his opponents, as this forces Shunsui to retreat into the shadows in order to save Nanao, who was struggling to escape from them. By using the shadows, Shunsui had launched a surprise attack on Tokinada, very similar to what he had done against Lil Barrow. But Tokinada ends up jumping to avoid the attack, which leaves him wide open to be attacked by Yoru. Uichi. After ditching her heavy leg armor and regaining her speed, she attempts to land another kick on him. But as her foot neared his body, there was a sudden eruption of cherry blossoms, which ended up slashing Yoruichi's foot and skin. This one strike had quickly unraveled the mystery of Enra Kyoten. This Zanpakuto had allowed Tokinada to use the abilities of multiple Shinigami like Kuriyashiki, Hanataro, Kira, and even Byakuya. Tokinada now begins to fight seriously as he uses is the Zanpakuto ability of Zenosuke Kurumadani, which allows him to manipulate the earth in order to swallow up all of his opponents at once. Now, Zenosuke's original Zanpakuto never really achieved feats to this scale, but it shows that Tokinada is at least able to activate the full potential of a Shinigami Zanpakuto. This is credited to the insane amounts of spiritual pressure that he possesses. Tokinada even states that Hanataro Zanpakuto Hisagomaru has the ability to heal wounds by absorbing them. As he demonstrates that he's able to use Hanataro's Zanpakuto ability to a greater scale than him once again thanks to him having higher spiritual pressure. This explains how he was able to heal the fatal injuries that he had sustained from Kensei earlier on. It's impressive that the writer of Can't Be Your Own World did not just lazily pick some of the most overpowered Zanpakuto abilities and just have Tokinada spam them. Instead, Narita had meticulously looked through the long list of Zanpakuto abilities and had utilized some that we don't really see that often within the Bleach manga. And the obvious overpowered one that he did end up using, which was Byakuya's, was the one that had given his game away. Nanao and Shunsui begin to question whether if there was a limit to Tokinada's ability to mimic other Zanpakuto. Tokinada wastes no time as he unleashes a wave of ash from his sword, which is revealed to be the power of Hainako. Now this is further amplified by his Reiatsu, so it wasn't just merely a cloud of ash like Rangiku's, but a deadly torrent that was 
difficult to get rid of. Tokinata made things worse by using a Hado spell called Tenran on the Ash Pile, which transformed it into a whirlwind of destruction, which was heading right towards the Shinigami. They managed to evade the attack which disperses in the area where the Quincy and Aranka were still fighting against the creatures created from Kuriyashiki's Shikai. Harry Bell had used her ability Cascada in order to wash away all of the ash before it could reach them. Now in response to Harry Bell's torrent of water, Tokinada had released a wave of flames which vaporized her water. Now these flames were undeniably those of Head Captain Yamamoto Zanpakuto Ryujin Jaka. Shunsui reassures everybody that these flames were nowhere near enough as powerful as Yamamoto's, which meant that while Tokinada could bring the best out of Zanpakuto abilities due to his high Reatsu, his Reatsu was also the limit on how much power he could draw out of certain very powerful Zanpakuto. So Tokinada would not be able to utilize the full extent of the abilities for Zanpakuto that were wielded by monsters like Yamamoto or Aizen. It was at this moment that Shunsui realized that if they are under the influence of Kyokasu Getsu for even a second, then it could spell their doom. Just as Shunsui realizes this, Tokinada smiles and casts Bakudo number 21, which fills the battlefield with red smoke as Shunsui closes his eyes because he doesn't want to be under the influence of Kyokasu Getsu. Upon opening his eyes, he realizes that a blade is headed right for Nanao, who is unable to dodge the attack. At the same time, all of the other individuals present had opened their eyes in order to dodge attacks that Tokinada had sent their way. Some were attacked by Senbon Zakura, while others were attacked by Hainako's Ash, and even some were attacked by the deadly creatures of Gagaku Kairo. It was at that split moment that everybody on the battlefield was looking at Enra Kyoten in some way, shape, or form. This was the moment that Tokinada was hoping for, as all of the Zanbakuto manifestations had disappeared like shattered glass. We know that this glass shatter is an iconic trademark of the awakening of Kyokasui Getsu. This meant that all of them had seen the Shikai release of Kyokasui Getsu, so they were now susceptible to its power. The story switches perspectives to Hisagi, who had been knocked out by Hikone earlier on. After regaining consciousness, he makes his way towards where he can sense everybody fighting. When he arrives onto the battlefield, he is met with a very bizarre sight. He sees that everybody there, including the head captain, along with the Quincy and the Aranka, appear to just be standing still. Shunsui was described to be so heavily injured that he could barely stand. This was obviously the doing of Tokinada, who was using Kyokasu Getsu, because in actuality, Shunsui was in pretty okay condition. Everyone was suspicious of Hisagi because they weren't sure if he was one of Tokinada's illusions. Tokinada clears up the confusion as he begins to speak to Hisagi and offers him a chance to write an article for the Serete Bulletin, which is about how much of a hero he is for successfully killing Shunsui, who he wants to claim has joined the Quincy and the Aranka in an attempt to overthrow the Soul Society. Hisagi ignores him and instead begins to question him about Hikone, because at this point, Hisagi has grown empathetic towards the child and wants nothing more than to save them from Tokinada's evil. Tokinada describes Hikone as nothing more than a tool that he is using to achieve his goals. This enrages Hisagi, who immediately activates Kazushini. But before he can fight him, Shunsui intervenes and grabs Hisagi and draws him into Kageoni's shadow world. This is so that he can fill Hisagi in on everything that has happened so far, and also explain to him who exactly they are up against. Hisagi, Nanao, and Shunsui return from the shadows, but Tokinada notices that Hisagi's eyes were closed, and he figures out quickly that they were planning to use him as a sensor in order to detect Tokinada at all times. This is so that they can attack him even when he's using Kyokasu Getsu. You can clearly see the strategy and tactics that are at play here, which I was mentioning at the very start of the video. Fittingly, Hisagi recalls how his late Captain Tozen was able to fight so well despite being blind, and he wonders if he could operate on that same level of accuracy considering that his senses are going to be the difference between life and death for his comrades. While thinking about Tozen, he then asks Tokinada if he had seen the fight between himself, Komamura, and Tozen within fake Karakura Town. In response, Tokinada activates Zemon Zakura and attempts to bury him with its lethal blades, as he then goes on to shamelessly bring up the memory of Tozen, as he reveals that he was the one who had killed Kakyo, Tozen's friend, thus revealing that he was indirectly responsible for the fall of Tozen, which had led to him joining Aizen and betraying the Soul Society. Tokinada is doing this in an attempt to enrage Hisagi so that he opens his eyes and falls under the spell of Kyokasui Getsu. 
to. But Hisagi doesn't fall for these childish tricks and he remains firm with his resolve. Tokinada takes things one step further as he begins to reveal the truth of the world to Hisagi. Shunsui tries to stop Tokinada but is unfortunately thwarted by Aura who had just arrived onto the scene. She apologizes for her rudeness to the head captain but insisted that the truth of the world was something that Hisagi needed to know. Now that he is uninterrupted, Tokinada continues his speech. By telling Hisagi this truth, I'm sure that Tokinada was planning on confusing him so that he realizes that everything that the Shinigami have been fighting for is a lie. Tokinada tells Hisagi the truth about the original sin as the story cuts away to Ichibe in the royal palace. When we return to the battlefield, Tokinada has just finished telling Hisagi everything, all the way down to Yuhabak being the son of the Soul King and also the current Soul King. Not forgetting to mention that the ancestors of the five great noble families were responsible for the mutilation of the Soul King and the creation of the Three Realms. While he was speaking to Hisagi, he was launching multiple attacks against his opponents, who at this point were all paralyzed from their injuries and their fear to use stronger attacks since Kyokasui Getsu could easily trick them into attacking each other. So Hisagi was really their only hope. After Tokinada had finished his speech, Hisagi was completely silent. He wasn't angry or afraid, nor did he feel the despair that Tokinada had desperately wanted him to feel. Instead, Hisagi had started to recall an event from a long time ago when he was still being trained by Tozen. It was back to the time when Tozen had taught him that one lesson which had come to define Hisagi's life. It was the lesson about how he could never become a true warrior unless he fears the sword that he wields. Now that Hisagi had come to fully understand the motivations of Tozen and even Aizen, he was now faced with the realization that they had in fact been right. And Hisagi's self-righteous attitude against them during the fake Karakura Town arc was really just a product of his own ignorance. Tokinada detects Hisagi's conflicted emotions here as he immediately begins to mock the young Shinigami, questioning whether if he has regrets about not having joined Aizen and Tozen now that he has realized the truth. Hisagi clarifies that he still doesn't accept that Tozen was in the right and he would have still stood against Aizen even if he had known the truth back then. Tokinada, believing that he has sufficiently broken the spirit of Hisagi, prepares to then finish him off. He uses none other than Tozen's own Benihiko technique, as a massive rain of needle-like blades fall towards Hisagi. Much to Tokinada's surprise, Hisagi parries the needles by using the chains of Kazushini. What was incredible was that this was a level of skill and precision that Hisagi had not shown in the fight thus far. And what was even more impressive was the fact that he had done this all with his eyes closed. Hisagi boldly tells Tokinada that a man like him who doesn't fear anything has absolutely no right to talk about Tozen. His attempt to make Hisagi feel despair had in fact motivated Hisagi and strengthened his convictions. Tokinada's sadism backfires here spectacularly. The speed of Kazushini's slashes and swings had started to push Tokinada back as he was unable to keep up with the continuous flurry of increasingly faster attacks from Hisagi. He had then decided to slow down Kazushini by increasing its weight by using Wabisuke. Just as he was about to strike Hisagi's blade, the chains of Kazushini had somehow dodged the attack of their own will. Ordinarily, this would have been impossible to do even with Hisagi's eyes open. This highlights that Hisagi was ascending to a whole new level here. Tokinada responds by creating a wall of Ryujin Jaka's flames in an attempt to destroy the chains and possibly melt Kazushini. But Hisagi's momentum had grown to the point that not even the fake flames of Ryujin Jaka had stood a chance against him. While keeping his eyes closed, Hisagi cuts the wall of flames apart with no effort. Tokinada's mind begins to race as it seems like he is about to lose to a mere lieutenant who was pretty much fighting him with his eyes closed. Despite having complete control of everybody's senses on the battlefield with Kyokasu Getsu, they had taken advantage of the situation in order to launch a simultaneous attack towards him. Tokinada was bombarded with a myriad of Seros, Holy Arrows, Kido, which were all flying at him in addition to Hisagi's attacks. He had successfully blocked most of the attacks, but he knew that he was going to be outnumbered very quickly if he did nothing. Hisagi continues to get faster and more precise with his attacks, but Tokinada had come up with a plan. He tried to block Hisagi's attacks with Zenbon Zakura, but this proved to be just as effective as 
trying to stop a chainsaw with a piece of paper, because Hisagi effortlessly blocked every single blade and made a strike towards Tokinada. This attack was successful in cutting off his right arm, which was the same arm that he was using to hold Enra Kyoten. This meant that Tokinada was now completely defenseless, and he was no longer able to use Kyokasuigetsu. Then the Sternritter Candice leads the charge with a Galvano Blast, followed by several attacks which land on Tokinada's body. Hisagi detected that Tokinada's spiritual pressure had vanished, which meant that he was more than likely dead. This left Ora Michibane as the final enemy to defeat, but due to her nature as a full bringer, she didn't possess a strong enough Reatsu signature for Hisagi to latch onto. This meant that Hisagi needed to open his eyes in order to see where she was, and right as he had opened them, he sees a blade that is pointed towards him. This blade suddenly shatters before his eyes as Tokinada has successfully put Hisagi under the spell of Kyoka Suigetsu. Tokinada had employed a genius strategy of faking his death along with using the presence of Ora Michibane in order to trap Hisagi. With Hisagi frozen in place, Tokinada turns his attention towards Ora. Now before Ora Michibane had arrived onto the battlefield, she was battling against the other Fullbringers. She had not only defeated Ginjo, Tsukishima, Giriko and Yukio, she had also taken control of their minds, and they were pretty much enslaved thanks to her power. We know that Tokinada had a lot of interest in Ginjo, who we identified as another Soul King candidate. When Tokinada had attempted to release Kyoka Suigetsu in order to control Ginjo, for some bizarre reason he was unable to release it. This was thanks to Aura who was using the power of a Fullbring, as she had dispersed some of her body into every piece of Enra Kyoten in the area, and had used that to capitalize on Kyoka Suigetsu's one weakness, which is that the sword cannot be released if somebody is touching the blade. What this means is that Tokinada hasn't just been betrayed by Aura, but she has effectively rendered his one trump card against his opponents useless. It's at that moment where Ginjo, who appeared to be a slave of Aura, had released his cross of scaffold and landed a critical slash against Tokinada. Aura had betrayed Tokinada for the sake of Hikone. Aura had created Hikone and raised the child for Tokinada. After having grown a strong bond with Hikone, she had wanted nothing more than to save Hikone from the dark fate that Tokinada had prepared for them. So when Aura appeared in front of Tokinada with the Fullbringers, they were never under her mind control. All of this was done just to fool Tokinada. After receiving this deadly wound, Tokinada retreats backwards as he explains that he was expecting Aura to betray him. Suddenly, Aura falls to one knee as her body rapidly begins to weaken. Tokinada explains that he is using the power of Ruriro Kujaku. This begins to absorb her spiritual power. Now this is the only type of attack that Aura is susceptible to, as Tokinada drains at least half of her spiritual pressure before Ginjo was able to knock him away with his blade. Ginjo wastes no time as he activates his Bankai state and begins to fight Tokinada. In an attempt for him to weasel out of his way of responsibility, he explains to Ginjo that he wasn't responsible for the deaths of his friends, but rather it was the main Tsunayashiro family branch that had given the order to kill the Fullbringers. Ginjo doesn't believe a word that he is saying, but he reveals that the reason that he wants to kill Tokinada is over something entirely different. Tokinada had framed Ukitake for everything when it was in fact by his orders and lies that Ukitake had come to know about Ginjo's situation. This situation is that after Ginjo had learned that his friends had been killed, he had retaliated in revenge against the Soul Society by killing a number of Shinigami. So a lot of what happened to Ginjo and his friends, including his reason for going rogue against the Soul Society, could all be tied back to Tokinada. With Ginjo knowing the truth now, he still says that he doesn't regret anything that he has done, but the one thing that he would have changed is that Tokinada should have been the first Shinigami that he had ever killed. Ginjo channels all of the rage that he had felt from hearing Tokinada's words as he releases a Getsuga Tensho, which was described to be as powerful as one of Ichigo's own. Tokinada deflects the attack with a blast of his own, as Tokinada realizes that the only way for him to kill Aura is to summon Hikone and to have them kill him. But right before he could shout out the order, a blade comes out of nowhere and slashes off Tokinada's arm which is holding Enra Kyoten, this time disarming Tokinada for real. He turns around and sees that the blade was none other than Hisagi's Kazeshini. The blade was wrapped around Urahara's Reiatsu concealing cloak, which had allowed Hisagi to land the surprise attack. Tokinada is confused by this as he wonders how he is able to sense him perfectly when he was supposed to be under the spell of Kyoka Suigetsu. Now this is when Shinji reveals that when Tokinada was carrying out his plan to put Hisagi under 
Kyokasu Igetsu, he had countered by using his Zanpakuto Sakanade in order to switch what Hisagi was looking at. This means that Hisagi was never under the spell of Kyokasu Igetsu, and he was only pretending to be caught in its influence. Tokinada has little time to react to this because the Getsuga Tensho, which he believed he had deflected, comes right back after him and lands square against his chest, leaving a brutal gash. The moment that Enra Kyoten had left his hands, Ichibe was somehow able to use his powers to claim it despite still being in the royal palace. This proves that Ichibe was watching the fight all along, which makes me wonder why it had taken him so long to act in order to help the Shinigami. This pretty much brings us to the end of this fight because after Tokinada was left with no means of fighting back and with his heavy injuries that he had sustained, he had used Kido in order to immediately teleport from the battleground to his castle within the sky. He had arrived there with the intention of using the weapons that he had installed to kill all of the enemies below, but to his surprise, all of them had been deactivated through Urahara's intervention. So in a final bit of desperation, Tokinada basically deactivated what was keeping the false palace he had created suspended in the air so that he could kill everyone below him by dropping the entire palace on them. This desperate venture is skillfully countered by Oromichibane, who uses her powers to prevent anything from falling below. Thus, once again, Aura is able to thwart Tokinada's plans. It's after this that Tokinada returns home and ends up dying in the most unpredictable way possible. If you want to learn more about this, then I recommend checking out my Tokinada Sunayashiro character analysis video, because there I discuss way more than just his fight against the Gotei 13. Tokinada's fight against the Gotei 13 is easily one of my favorite fights in all of Bleach. It felt like a game of chess with how many twists and turns that there were, along with how several Zambakuto abilities were utilized in incredibly creative ways. The Can't Fear Onward light novels are an absolute treat for any Bleach fan, and they really do justice to Kubo's manga. So if you have yet to read the Can't Fear Onward light novels, then definitely go and check them out, because they have been translated into English. I do hope that these light novels do get an anime adaptation, because I'd love to see Tokinada versus the Gotei 13 animated properly. We've reached the point of the video where I want to hand over the discussion to all of you. What do you guys think about this incredible battle? What was your favorite moment from this climactic battle? Personally, I loved how Tokinada was using all of the different Zanpakuto abilities, and it wasn't just obvious overpowered abilities, he was using really obscure Zanpakuto. Tokinada was a huge sadist who loved nothing more than to see the suffering of others, so it's really satisfying to see all of the different factions of Bleach join together in order to put a stop to him and his evil plans. Be sure to continue the discussion about this incredible fight in the comments, and lastly, thank you for making it to the end of this video, and I cannot wait to see you in my next Bleach Explained video. A massive thank you goes out to all of my amazing Patreon supporters for helping to make this video possible. If you also want to support the channel and see your name in the end of my videos, then check out my Patreon which has loads of perks like early video access and so much more. Thank you for sticking around till the end of the video and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.